Let's check in on SpaceX's journey to get people and payloads to the moon, Mars, and other distant destinations. Award-winning futurist and researcher, keynote speaker Nicholas Batman, to joining us on Canada Now. And Nick, SpaceX's Starship SN10 spacecraft took a test flight last week and went out in a blaze of glory about eight minutes after landing. Yeah, uh, I was watching it, Jeff. I'd sort of forgotten about it, and then suddenly I saw it on Twitter. It was like, oh, now live is like quickly threw it on. I, I sat my son, who's only seven months, on my lap. Uh, he quickly sort of scuttled off, but I was sort of glued to the screen. <laughs> and it was amazing to see it like launch, and obviously there'd been a couple of launches before, and they'd both uh, exploded upon landing. But seeing it land and actually land properly was absolutely breathtaking it was incredible it's an absolute achievement a few years earlier i remember watching the two booster rockets landing or a single booster rocket landing for the first time and i actually i actually burst into tears at that moment it's such a huge moment for for us as as a human race to be able to you know take off in a rocket and land as a rocket and now we're in these new starships the sn10 uh, it landed you know, a few, a few, a few minutes later, and sort of unexpectedly, you know, due to a propellant link leak, so they think, it then exploded. So you know, it makes for good fireworks, right, Jeff? But yeah. you know what? SpaceX, they've already got SN11 on the launch pad, ready, ready to like getting ready to go in the next few weeks. So you know, here's hoping that they get there, they can land it, they can prove this technology, and then we can think about you know what the next steps are. Well, it's amazing how soon all of this can happen because Musk's, Musk's goal is to have humanity become a multi-planet species and uh, SpaceX aims to get a Starship prototype to orbit this year and he expects the final space flight system to be flying people regularly by 2023 by 2023 so this this is all happening like if if one hasn't been paying attention to this it feels like it's just happening overnight. I, I love the hyperbole of, of Elon Musk, you know, the big ideas and pushing further and yeah. faster. And he's done this with all of his businesses. You know, you know, people doubt the big thinkers and then the big thinkers with enough money over time can can sometimes make these things happen. But yeah, this push is really, really very impressive. And um, the money that they save um, in being able to recycle rockets and, and reuse them um, can actually mean that they've got faster cycles of being able to send payloads up into space. We've got the Artemis uh, lunar landings uh, sort of being planned in the next couple of years. That's going to be really interesting. You know, is it going to be a regular occurrence to be jumping into a, a Starship rocket and then flying flying around within, uh, you know, three years? Well, Elon Musk has got a hell of a pace um, going already. So, uh, you know, we're, we're at the beginning of 2021. Why not? You know, this is exp this is exponential thinking. So, uh, you know, he's brought that to the space race. Well, and, and, you know, I was talking to my kid last night, my, my older one, and I was telling him about you coming on the show. I always talk about when you're coming on the show because it's always it's always something interesting. And it, I, I always feel like, hey, the, the things that we're talking about, it's going to happen in your lifetime. This is going to be a big deal. Um, and uh, I was talking to him about what he could possibly regularly be looking forward to. And I was talking to him about, you know, sending people up to Mars and, and taking vacations up into space. And he says, wait, am, is that something I'm going to do? And I went, well, yeah, I, I, I think that's something that you're going to be doing, that you're going to know. It's And it's remarkable to me that uh, that, that it, 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 again, is happening uh, so soon, but that it, it, in, in our kids' lifetime that all of this is going to be like, yeah, this is what we do. Yeah, in the next five to ten years, suborbital travel around the planet, um, let alone going to the moon or even Mars as a, as a bigger and loftier goal, could become commonplace. You know, within ten years, you and me spending a few thousand dollars to fly from New York to Tokyo in like 30, 45 minutes. Wow. Could, could be normal, right? And and that's absolutely wild. And it's going to really flip the whole uh, travel industry on ahead. I mean, remember when Concorde could do, what was it, London to New York in five hours or, or no, was it three hours or something, right, Jeff? Yeah. And it was just like, wow, and people would, would, would pay through the nose for that. I mean, this is, this is that new sort of travel. I tell you what, the first people to do this are going to be some of the <laughs> you know, going to be some of the bravest people out there, right? But you know what? Like 
you know all the billionaires and and you know uh, geeks and and true believers of 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 muskdom yeah. are going to be like the first on, on the uh, on the ramp to get on the rocket to to fly from one place to the next and with this uh, this starship uh, fleet um like, like spacex founder ceo elon musk wants to have starship carry the entire load of flights and phase out all other flight hardware. So in looking at what happened last week, this is like the next step into that happening. Yeah, I think I think it's <laughs> it's like wishful thinking that suddenly you're going to replace every single plane on the planet or anything like that. I mean, you know what, we're still going to want to fly from 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 Billy Bishop Airport in Toronto down to LaGuardia. This is not not the way that we'll be doing it on a Starship, right? So <clears throat> I I think for those long haul journeys you know he could have a good point uh, you know within 30 years maybe it, it's gonna replace uh, a, a lot of the uh, the aircraft out there um maybe if he can make this uh, this hardware cheap enough uh, but we have to remember that you need to have certain conditions to take off and land these things right so we're still going to be restricted by mother earth and the cycles of of planetary weather so you know there, there are some things that we do need to consider in the mix 2023 is going to be a, a big year because uh, SpaceX already has an operational Starship flight targeted to launch then. The Dear Moon mission, uh, booked by a, a Japanese billionaire who's looking for crew members to join him on that six-day journey uh, around the moon. Do you think he's going to have a bunch of takers b- between now and then? It's like, no, sorry, we've, we've got enough people here. So many people are inspired by the idea of space flight and leaving, leaving this Earth. I right now, there's, yes. <laughs> there's gonna there's gonna be a queue. There's gonna be a queue of people, Jeff, right? Yeah. yeah. And it's gonna be, you know I just hope it's not like uh, a, a flight full of YouTube influencers, right? Yeah. But like yeah. I also <laughs> feel that it should be a fight a flight full of people that truly deserve to do this journey and not just like the Uber wealthy or the privileged. But I, I have a feeling that that's likely to be who it's gonna yeah. who, who's gonna join this uh, this billionaire uh, Japanese guy. How lucrative a, a business is the space business right now? So it's really interesting. Uh, you, so I'm going to tell you a story. Like three years yeah. ago, I was sat in I was sat in the, this uh, this accommodation in San Francisco in the Haight Ashbury district, and these are these are communal houses. And there's about 20 people that live in these places at any point in time. And we we're sat around having a communal dinner. Everything was free, and they were they were paying for it as part of their their rent. It was free to me. I was just and around a table of 20 people, there was like 10 people in the space industry. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, you know, isn't there just like NASA and, and like the big companies providing hardware? And they're like, no, you know, we're, we're, looking at, we're looking at asteroid mining. We're looking at niche technologies. We're looking at software and interfaces. And it's wild. But like by 2030, they think that the, the market opportunity for, for the space industry is going to be $1.4 trillion. And that's rockets, communications, which is huge business right now. Uh, imagery and surveillance, satellites, even and, and the crude flights that we've been talking about. And I think that that's just a drop in the bucket. Because when we start to think about multi-planetary sort of civilizations or, you know, as I think it's going to be scientific research outposts, I think that you're going to be like doubling that three, four trillion dollars. There's going to be a big, uh, a big debate around: is that the right way to be spending the money when we need to be investing in the the, the safety and sovereignty of the Earth for mm. for all who live here, right? Well, who is um, you know first on the list as far as being so advanced in in all of this, so getting ahead of the curve? in terms of the space business? Like, are we looking at China because they've got that, that biosphere that, that made enough food and oxygen to last, what, 200 days? You know what? Russia and China have sort of, uh, they're, they're best friends. So so Putin and Xi, they're best friends. Russia and China pallying to get together. I mean, remember, Russia was hugely progressive in the space race. I mean, Yuri Gagarin, let's not forget, let, let's not forget they put Laika the dog into space. You know, it freaked out the Americans like no end. And then finally, you know, America put a man on the moon and, and, and uh, you know, the rest is history. But yes, um, China and Russia are going to come together. China's got a lot of resources, a lot of willing people, a lot of great technology companies trying to work this out. And, and you know what? This, this is a new space race, Jeff. And I think that, uh, you know, the U.S. and Canada and the U.K. and France and all these 
uh, countries are getting together. And I think that the divide is still there. And I think that this new space race is all going to be about, you know, who can dominate space. And maybe that's going to be from a defense perspective, a research perspective. If we start looking at mining and those operations, if you can get onto asteroids, they, they could be worth quadrillions of dollars, right? You know, this is this is the new frontier, literally. You know, over the next 200 years is going to be incredibly exciting for the space race. And as a futurist, I look that far out. But do I know what it's going to look like even in 100 years? Not exactly, but we're definitely on the right trajectory, excuse the pun, to, to land in a, a really interesting place. Well, is the race for space more to uh, to, to get Get out there is to uh, take what we can uh, from, um, you know, from the moon, for example, uh, materials from the moon to, to, to help out what we have here on Earth. I, I really hope not. I don't think that there's going to be a huge amount of materials um, on the moon that are going to be that useful. I mean, the, the real treasure troves are, are some of the, the asteroids that are out there, you know. Going to Mars is going to be a, a, a great jump off point for any sort of travel beyond Mars. That's going to be its big point. You know, the, the, these ideas of civilizations and cities on, on Mars are kind of wildly overblown and, and bloated. I don't believe that let's go and live on Mars. I don't think it's going to be a nice place to live. But from a scientific perspective, it's the, uh, it's the interplanetary equivalent of going and living in, the, in Antarctica in one of those research stations, mm, right? Yeah, yeah. So a little bit more on this biosphere because I, I'm fascinated uh, with this. So these, uh, these students in China, they generated enough oxygen, water, and food in a self-contained habitat to last a full year without help from the outside world. I mean, that's that's incredible. If they're doing that now, I mean, goodness knows what's going to happen within a couple of years. Yeah, there's a couple of groups trying this out, and one group that, that did this 200 days could have stayed there for much, much longer, right? Yeah. So, so, so they generated oxygen from plants and vegetables, grown under, un, under LED lights, and almost everything else they needed for, for survival came from recycling. And, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, water from the human body or whatever, that kind of happens on the International Space Station, right? Mm. <clears throat> Just 2% of materials, including seeds, toilet paper, and cleaning products, came courtesy of the outside. This is wild. This is a game changer, right? This is technology that's going to be sorely needed for uh, the Artemis missions and also to, to go further as well. Well, check out NicholasBaminton.com, futurist researcher, keynote speaker, Nicholas Baminton. Always a pleasure, my friend. This is fascinating stuff, and we'll revisit uh, the, the space business and the space topic uh, again, I'm sure, in, in, in the many weeks and months uh, to come. Thank you, Nick. Appreciate it. Fly me to the moon, Jeff. <laughs> All right, he'll be there. He, he, you know, he, you know, he says, "Ah, you know, everyone else, everyone else is going to try that." Nick is always the first one in the pool. He, he is, he'll be on that flight. He, he'll be the first one out of here to try something new. That, that's just the way he rolls.